All right, it is 3.30, so I'm going to get going. Um, and due to being behind and to try to not have this day finish far over five o'clock, I think it might run a little bit over. So if you need to leave, that's fine at the end of the day. Um, but I had some kind of technical slides in this presentation like I did for the states-based modeling, but I'm going to skip through a lot of that and just like post the slides online that are annotated with what each parameter represents. And if you have more questions, then feel free to reach out to me. Um, but otherwise, for the sake of time, I'm going to try to get through these slides really quickly and get to the code. All right, so I'm going to be covering non-parametric Bayesian models for movement ecology. And this includes a couple different models, um, more than just one. So returning back to this table and this figure I showed earlier, I'm going to help use this to characterize what these models are doing. Um, so what are these non-parametric Bayesian movement models? Um, so these are models I helped develop when I was at the University of Florida with Dennis Valle and uh, Rob Fletcher. And um, there are two different types of these models. One that is strictly a classification model. So it um, is basically, like I mentioned on that, the earlier set of slides, it's a finite mixture model, but um, instead of what a lot of people often use in maybe machine learning, they will use a Gaussian mixture model. So a mixture of normal distributions. In this case, we're using categorical or multinomial distributions, um, including this, these non-parametric priors. Um, so we're just lumping observations together, but they're not um, related in time at all. There's no Markov property. Um, alternatively, there's another method that will analyze a time series of the track and then um, break it up into segments. So perform segmentation and then clusters these segments together after the fact into behavioral states. And that's kind of similar to something shown here on the right. So like I said, there's two main types. One that's a mixture model for movements. And we haven't given this model a name yet, but given uh, the name for our other model, I think it might be apt to call this M3, the mixture model for movement. Um, and the other model that we developed is called the mixed membership method for movement. Um, and it's like, okay, these names sound almost identical. Why are, how are they different? So a mixture model is essentially hard clustering observations directly into behavioral states. Whereas the mixed membership method assumes that different track segments can be represented by different pro proportions of different behavioral states. So it's not like one or another, it's a mixture potentially of multiple states. So both models are able to accommodate multiple movement variables. They don't assume that movement variables are well characterized by standard PDFs or probability density functions necessarily, although they could be. And it's also able to simultaneously estimate the likely number of behavioral states without fitting multiple models. So like we, we just did with hidden Markov models, we fitted different uh, models with different numbers of states. And then afterwards we would potentially need to use AIC or some other information criteria to perform model selection and determine which model we think is best. So what's the true number, most likely number of behavioral states? And there are different issues with that. Um, so this tries to or account for some of these issues and remove those. So focusing on this first method, the mixture model for movements, which hereafter I'll just refer to as M3 for ease of speaking. Um, it essentially follows this workflow I've already shown before where we have our true track and this is broken up into observations, which can be characterized by different variables such as step length and or turning angle or other things. And then we cluster these observations directly into behavioral states. So we're skipping this track segmentation process. Whereas for M4, we're essentially doing exactly what is shown here, where we're evaluating these different movement variables, breaking them into segments, and then um, clustering these segments into behavioral states. 
where each segment is made up of potentially multiple states. So again, it could include any of these movement metrics I've discussed previously for hidden Markov models, but other uh, metrics that could be used, other variables in this model or in hidden Markov models could include distance to a near, nearest feature of interest. So it could be distance to like a den or a borough or the coastline or some other boundary or feature of interest. Um, displacement from the initial location. So we cover this a little bit with hidden Markov models before incorporating at the ends displacements. It can include accelerometer data. So if you have an accelerometer attached to your animal as part of your tag, you can get triaxial accelerometry and analyze that. Um, some tags might summarize the accelerometer data into activity counts. Um, that could be used as well. Or any other ancillary environmental data measured by your biologger tag. And then plenty of other things I'm not even going to try to touch on right now. The sky's the limit, essentially, on what you could include here. Um, so first, I'm going to discuss the framework for M3, since it's a little bit simpler. Um, it's a one-stage model where we're clustering these observations directly. So I'm going to try to compare this to, uh, compare and contrast this to hidden Markov models to get a sense of what it's doing. Um, but similar to hidden Markov models, the M3 method estimates discrete behavioral states. So unlike the state-space model, it is able to estimate these kind of finite states that you're trying to look for potentially um, and does not account for location error. So if you were to use this framework and you're using Argos data, you need to account for the location error from a state-space model first. Um, unlike hidden Markov models, this is not a mechanistic movement model. So there's no underlying correlated random walk or random walk or biased random walk or any other iteration of that. Um, this is essentially evaluating a time series. There's no assumption of how the animal's moving. Um, point two, it doesn't include a Markovian assumption. So like I mentioned before, there's no temporal dependence. Each point in time is independent of every other point. Um, it also doesn't use parametric probability density functions for these movement variables, meaning that essentially instead of using a continuous distribution uh, to define step lengths to turning angles, what you need to do is discretize these variables um, into bins and then essentially analyze these histograms of variables, which can be more flexible than maybe some of these parametric distributions would allow. And uh, four, it's able to estimate the likely number of behavioral states while simultaneously estimating these state-dependent distributions that characterize each behavioral state um, instead of needing to run multiple models and then use model selection to compare them. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to, again, breeze through the kind of mathematical expressions here, just do two time, try to get started on the code. Um, so I'm just going to run through all these and just leave all the labels up. So essentially we have in the top left, these observations of different movement variables. So this could be step length, turning angle, anything else labeled Y here with one or two indicating which variable it is. And this is given the latent state indicator. So whether it's in behavioral state one or behavioral state two or state three or anything um, where that is equal to one of k possible latent states. So we're saying, what's the observed step length when the behavioral state z is equal to state one or state two or state four? And it's defined by a categorical distribution with these state dependent distributions um, within them defined by this parameter phi. And there's a different phi for each behavioral state um, in each movement variable here. So whether it's step length or turning angle. Um, so a categorical distribution is just a um, single instance of a multinomial distribution, the same way that a Bernoulli distribution is the single instance of a binomial distribution. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, um, just you can ask me later and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but based on these, these variables, we have time indexed by I and the states are indexed by k in this case from one to k. And we're assuming these latent states again, coming from a categorical distribution 
with probabilities of being in each state that sum up to one. And these probabilities are assumed to come from this non-parametric Bayesian prior called a truncated stick breaking prior. And I think this is really cool because this is what allows us to estimate the likely number of behavioral states without needing to know them ahead of time. Um, so this diagram from um, a recent paper by Vali and colleagues this past year showing that first, let's say you start off with um, assuming only one behavior, one behavioral state, and then you account for potentially two behavioral states. So one might represent 19% of the observations and then another is 81%. And from that 81%, let's say you break this again. So I like guess stick breaking process where that 81% is now split up between these two states, one in red, that's 27% and one in green, that's 54%. And you keep going and going. And this tends to favor fewer states than, let's say you say there's up to 10 possible states that could exist. And the model is going to favor fewer states. So it might say there's only three presents, even though you said try up to 10. Um, whereas if you were to do something like this for a hidden Markov model, you would need to fit a two-state model and a three-state model all the way up to 10 and then compare them. And that's not really feasible or useful. Um, so this, this Bayesian prior, this truncated stick breaking prior helps us estimate the likely number of states directly. Okay, um, and then this parameter phi comes from a Dirichlet distribution. So this is essentially a prior on the probability of being in each bin or each category from that categorical distribution, defining, in this case, the step lengths and turning angles. Um, so this is showing what the different values for a Dirichlet distribution might look like and how that impacts this surface. Um, so the larger the values are, the closer it is to the middle, or there's a greater probability of being in any states. If the values are all like less than one, that means it's highly probable to be in only one of the states. Um, that's what I'm trying to show here from this slide I took from Nigel Crook. And you can potentially even break this down or factor, uh, do some matrix factorization here, where we start off with our original data sets, which can be thought of as observations on the rows and then our binned data streams on our columns. And this is essentially equal to a matrix labeled theta, which defines for the columns, each of the different behavioral states and then the rows, the observations. This is the probability of belonging to each state multiplied by this matrix phi, which represents our state dependent distribution. So in this case, states are on the rows instead of the columns and the columns are now the binned data streams. So the matrices theta and phi are what we're gonna be investigating when we're running the model. So theta is gonna represent the probability of being in a given state, and phi is going to be our state dependent distributions that characterize like step lengths and turning angles for state one and state two, for example. Um, moving on to uh, the model M4. So this is the segmentation based model. It segments the tracks, then clusters the segments. It's similar to hidden Markov models in that it estimates, again, discrete behavioral states and doesn't account for location error. But unlike the M3 model, it does somewhat account for this temporal autocorrelation because it assumes that each segment is made up of relatively homogeneous movement patterns or like values of these variables. Um, so there's no like autocorrelation parameter, but it assumes that one observation in time is probably similar to the next observation in time and so forth. Um, and it just tries to look for these breaks in these variables. And unlike hidden Markov models, again, it's not mechanistic, doesn't include a Markovian assumption, doesn't use these parametric probability density functions. Um, it also estimates, again, these segments level behavioral state probabilities, which is much different from a state-space model or a hidden Markov model. And like the M3 method, estimates the likely number of behavioral states. So the main difference between this model and the M3 model is that this one segments the tracks and then clusters them. And each segment could be potentially made up of multiple behavioral states. Otherwise, a lot of the underlying machinery is almost identical. And this is a two-stage model because first you need to segment the tracks, 
inspect the segmentation process, make sure that worked properly, and then you could feed those results into the clustering model. So the first stage of the model estimates the breakpoints to segment the tracks, and it's going to analyze and segment each track separately or independently. And this is done using a Bayesian reversible jump Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, um, essentially meaning that it's able to propose the removal or the addition or the change of different parameters. So it's a really nice, flexible way to account for a lot of uncertainty um, without, again, testing different models and then comparing them after the fact using a AIC or BIC, DIC, any other information criteria. Uh, the next stage, the second stage in the model is what's clustering these segments into states. And this is done using a Bayesian latent Dirichlet allocation model. And that's what's done to, yeah, again, group these segments into behavioral states. So um, here is what I think is a nice flow chart or framework um, showing how this could be done. So starting at the top, you have a given track for a given individual. And this could be broken up into any such data stream. So in this case, I'm showing step lengths on the left and turning angles on the right. And I'm also showing how I break down each continuous density distribution into discrete bins. Um, so in this case, I'm using quantiles actually to break up step lengths. And I'm using equal bin widths to break up turning angles. Um, here in the middle is the time series for step lengths and turning angles shown along with these black vertical lines, which represent the breakpoints estimated by the model for this one individual. And you can get a plot like this for every individual in your data set. Um, and then this is what segments the tracks into these different segments that are supposedly different from one another. And you would feed these segments into the LDA model, which clusters these together into states. So here we see the state dependent distributions um, as essentially histograms. So they're not smooth, continuous distributions like hidden Markov models, but they might allow for some additional flexibility because of that. Um, so this estimated three behavioral states we see here, um, shown by these different colors. The top row is um, a resting state. The middle row is an ARS or area restricted search states. And the bottom row is representing a uh, transit state. And on the right side, we're seeing the probability of being in each state for each segment over time. Um, so as shown above with these different breakpoints, that represents these different track segments, which are defined by different proportions or probabilities of each behavioral state. So there's a lot of stuff happening here. Um, but again, this is actually for a simulated data set. So um, there's probably a lot more rapid change here than what would actually occur in a empirical data set from a tagged animal. And then you can use these estimates to annotate your original track. So in this case, you might say, what's the um, primary behavior that's estimated for a given segment and then label your points accordingly. Or you can say, what's the probability of each of these points being in a given behavioral state and then label them like that as well. So for this first stage of the model, um, the reversible jump Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. Um, I think this is a nice representation of how that actually works. So again, I'm going to kind of breeze through the actual like algorithm and the mathematical expressions that I show after this in the slides. But I want to focus at least on this conceptual map to give you a sense of what it's doing. Um, so consider we have this model labeled MK. K is the number of the iterations in this Markov chain this Bayesian model. So we could have one, two, however many iterations we're running for our Bayesian model. And each model MK is defined by a set of breakpoints. Um, so we have breakpoint labeled by B, and this is breakpoint one from model K. So B1K, breakpoint two for model K, breakpoint three for model K for times one to a thousand, assuming we have a thousand observations in our track here. And for um, this one iteration to the next iteration labeled MK prime. So let's say this is iteration one and iteration two of the model. Um, if we start off with these three breakpoints, we have three options we can take to dealing with this. We can either use a birth 
or essentially an addition of another breakpoint, we can optionally have a death or the removal of a breakpoint, or we can have a swap or the change of an existing breakpoint to a different location. And you would essentially use a Metropolis Hastings um, algorithm to decide whether you're going to accept or reject this proposal at random, essentially, by chance. And whoops, um, if you do this over a long Markov chain, eventually, hopefully, that will stabilize and the model will be able to um, identify what might be the correct number of and location of breakpoints for each track. The second stage, so the clustering, is done using latent Dirichlet allocation, which was originally developed and used for essentially data mining and like documents. So if we think of um, trying to cluster different words in a paper like this one into different topics um, for multiple different papers that we're looking into, we could think of this related to animal movement as instead of topics, we have states, so behavioral states. Instead of documents, we have track segments identified by that uh, reversible jump model. And then instead of proportions of each of these topics, we have state proportions and their assignments to these track segments. So each of these states are made up of proportions of these different words, essentially, in this case. But um, these would be like the bins for each movement variable. Yeah, so these are our state dependent distributions. And again, I'm going to skip over the technical stuff for the most part, but I'm going to at least try to show it here on the slide. But this is an example of what um, a plot looks like when you're estimating the breakpoints for an empirical track. So this is for a, uh, a snail kite from this, this paper that I helped publish this past year. Um, and showing the estimates of breakpoints for step lengths and turning angles. Um, and again, we have these models defined by a set of breakpoints, and then we're estimating um, the number of behavioral states based on this matrix theta. And one way we can do this, which tends to be the default here, is to do so in an unsupervised method. So we're saying that we don't know where any of these breakpoints are occurring. We're going to let the model decide that for us. And this is called unsupervised segmentation. And in especially the machine learning literature, this is just unsupervised mis machine learning. Um, you could also have things such as semi-supervised or supervised machine learning. Um, so for this particular model, actually, you can also use um, semi-supervised segmentation where you provide the model a set of potential breakpoints that you might know ahead of time. Let's say you know that one behavioral state is occurring at these locations. Um, you could feed those to the model and the model will decide whether it should keep them or change them um, or remove them. So those are all possibilities, but they're not necessarily going to be left unchanged. Um, so essentially the model is seeking breakpoints that define relatively homogeneous track segments. Okay, into the clustering model, the LDA model. Um, again, we're using a lot of categorical distributions um, to estimate these latent states and the Dirichlet distribution to define these state dependent distributions. And then ultimately the truncated stick breaking prior as we do with M3 to estimate the likely number of states. And our results and output might look something like this where we're estimating the proportion of time on average per track segment spent in each behavior. So the higher the proportion on average, that means that there's likely to be at least one, two, maybe even three states, unlikely to be four or five, six or seven states. And then these are the distributions that were estimated. So in this case, three states were most likely. Um, and again, track segments can be comprised of multiple behavioral states as determined by the model, or the model might suggest that only one state is present. And very similar to M3, this is the matrix factorization, where instead of observations on the rows here, this is track segments. Um, so for theta, it's track segments and states. And for phi, it's states and bin data streams, which is 
exactly the same as for the M3 model. So methods to fits, um, since it's using a Bayesian non-parametric approach, it's only available to be fit with a Bayesian model. Um, and there are functions readily available to fit these models within the Bayes move R package that I helped develop. Um, and for further details, especially since I had to gloss over a bunch of things, you can find those in the Cullen et al. or the Valet et al. papers from this past year for the M4 or the M3 models. Um, so some motivating examples from some of these recent papers. Again, these models are all new. So um, essentially nobody else has used these as of yet. And there's a paper that we have in review that is using uh, the M3 model to estimate behavioral states for giant armadillos. So this one plot is for three different focal snail kites and showing these changes in um, this juvenile that was tagged at the nest that eventually dispersed and then um, went through its least initial or first breeding season in uh, the Kissimmee Lakes region of central Florida. And again, here's the, uh, some of the results from that giant armadillo paper. So we analyzed activity counts. So that's just a summarization of an accelerometer tag, uh, speed and turning angle and identified four different behavioral states. And with that, we can start doing some, some modeling with this.